Good evening and welcome to the third April 2023 edition of the new Colorado Area Health Education Center's rollout of the historic J.J. Cohen's Mini Med. My name is Dr. Josina Romero O'Connell and I'm the director of the Colorado Area Health Education Center. We call it coe -HEC. On behalf of all of us here at coe -HEC and the Anschutz Medical Campus, I extend our deepest appreciation for your attendance. Tonight, we here at the AMC will be zooming into the class with hundreds of Coloradans into a session produced by the Western Colorado Area AHEC Center. Our presenter, Dr. Frazetta, will be speaking live from Montrose Memorial Hospital in Montrose, Colorado. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Nicole Heil from Western Colorado AHEC, who will introduce tonight's presenter. Take it away in Montrose, Nicole. Good evening. Um, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Gail Frazetta. She is board certified in family medicine and is a fellow of the American Academy of Family Practice. Additionally, she has specialty training in hormone optimization and osteoporosis management. She has interest in disease prevention and wellness with expert knowledge in nutrition, having graduated with honors in nutritional sciences from Cornell University. She was the team physician for the Colorado Explosion, the women's professional basketball team based in Denver, she is an associate clinical professor with the University of Colorado School of Medicine and continues to train medical students and advanced practice professionals. Dr. Frazetta is an advocate for hormone therapy her entire career, and she gives lectures around the country on the subject. She is the 2019 Humanitarian of the Year for the State of Colorado, presented by Copic Insurance. She received this prestigious award mostly for her years of advocacy within the local community for sexuality and relationship education and concussion management for student athletes. Dr. Frazetta completed a research project evaluating the impact of testosterone pellet therapy <laughs> changes in postmenopausal women. She is a certified clinical densitometrist by the International Society of Clinical Densitometry, providing independent consultations in the area. As a multi-modality specialist, she is able to address patients' health needs in a more comprehensive way to helping others achieve health optimization in a medically proven, evidence-based approach. And we are so grateful to have her. Thank you, Dr. Frazetta. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be here tonight to be the first presenter for a HEX outreach program. So I'd like to thank them for this opportunity. Um, I just, you've heard already quite a bit of background about me already. I think importantly, um, I approach medicine very, in a very evidence-based fashion. I, I'm not necessarily an East versus Western medicine. Um, you know, there, it, there's either data or there's not data. So my presentation tonight will hopefully um, encompass that for you. I initially started as a, a full-scope family practice doctor here in Montrose 25 years ago. I did my undergraduate, I'm sorry, my residency training in Denver prior to coming to Montrose. Uh, initially, I did full scope family practice. I did obstetrics, ICU care, nursing home rounds, um, flex SIGs, vasectomy, circumcisions, the works. What has happened over the years is my, pro my uh, practice has become more focused in terms of managing bone health and hormone health. Both of those are very integra integrally related. So for tonight's presentation, um, not, let's see. Oh, there we go. So for tonight, importantly, I don't have any financial disclosures and I will in fact be talking about non-FDA approved treatments. And that's kind of an important thing to understand. In family practice, roughly 40% of what I would do in, for, in family practice is non-FDA approved. The FDA basically is a way for pharmaceuticals to get a drug patented. And now patents last about 20 years and often uh, cost quite a bit when you have a patented medication. So um, the uh, hormones I will talk about, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, in fact, have been FDA approved, but maybe not for some specific uses that I will talk about. 
um, if we look at reproductive transitions, you know, many of us are very familiar with in adolescence, the talk, perhaps you would have heard dark crevices of some fifth grade classroom. We've gotten a little more modern these days at handling it a little, a little bit better. However, sexuality as a concept is barely touched upon. Our education now is basically about your menstrual cycle coming and how not to get pregnant if you are lucky enough to get that. Beyond that, women don't get any other education. I feel like I should be doing a talk, the talk for perimenopausal women perhaps, or something similar. But there are all of these life transitions for women, yet there's very little education given to help uh, women negotiate these. Um, hormone therapy in the year 2000 was a standard of care to be offered at menopause. A study done at that time um, among physicians said 70% of folks felt that they should be um, at least have a conversation about whether or not they wanted to take hormones at the time of menopause. So what happened? Hormones are bad. This is what I hear routinely, but you can't take hormones because they're bad. Well, what hormones are bad? All hormones are bad? Like we wouldn't collectively be here without hormones. It is how our body communicates, our organ system communicates are through hormones. So what's bad? Well, estrogen, estrogen's bad. Why is estrogen bad? Well, it causes breast cancer. So I usually start every talk I give on hormones um, about breast cancer because it is the most feared cancer among women. Um, this is despite the fact that women are 10 times more likely to die of heart disease than they are of breast cancer. And in fact, more women actually die of lung cancer than of breast cancer. But we continually hear on and on about breast cancer. Um, breast cancer these days, very thankfully, about 95% uh, treatable and curable, which is an, an incredible um, statistic when you think about that. So 95% of women survive their breast cancer. Um, risk factors for breast cancer? Well, first and foremost, it's being female. Men actually get breast cancer. Roughly 2% of breast cancer occurs in men. And you have to ask, why is it that men get so little breast cancer and women get it quite oftenly? Well, uh, breast, uh, men have 20 times more testosterone than women. And uh, ultimately it's the testosterone that is very protective against getting birth. So the other big risk factor besides being female is your age. So the older you are, the more likely you are to get breast cancer as a female. Um, everyone talks about this one in eight number for women getting breast cancer. Well, it is one in eight. If you live until your 80s, women in their 50s, it's probably one in 64 or something along those lines. So the one in eight number makes it even scarier if you look around the room. Well, that, that's among 80-year-old women. Um, there are certainly other risk factors involved like family history and dietary changes, et cetera. But really the two big hitters are um, being female and your age. So the WHI trial, this in fact, released in 2002, a uh, NIH funded study, the largest randomized control trial ever done on hormones basically sunk the ship. This study was done using Prempro and Premarin. Those are synthetic uh, hormones. Premarin is horse urine estrogen. Prempro is horse urine estrogen combined with fake progesterone. Uh, Medroxyprogesterone, in fact, is what it is. So additionally, this study excluded women who had symptoms. So for you or female with hot flashes, you could not partake in this study. It was additionally done in older women. The average age was 63, and they were not a very healthy cohort of women. 50% were either current or previous smokers. A third of them had high blood pressure. The majority of them were obese or overweight. So this single study really was, was these two synthetic drugs and older women, and somehow, 40 years of data went away because of this single study. And, and still here we are and we have not recovered. So evaluating the data, um, it's really important as I've already alluded to, to know what in fact the research was. 
Um, what type of hormone did they use? Did they use something that your body makes like estradiol or did they use equine estrogen? Did they use progesterone, which is made by your ovaries, or did they use medroxy progesterone, which is made by pharmaceutical companies? What, how did they give that hormone back? Did they give it via a pill? Did they give it transdermally? Did they give it via a patch? What about the timing? Were women newly menopausal? Were they 20 years after menopause? When was that therapy started? And do they even look at the correct hormone? You've heard me already allude to testosterone in regard to breast cancer. Um, was that even in the equation? So observation does not prove causation. This is so critical to understand. Um, as an example, I could say the number of TVs you have in your house is directly related to obesity. And our brains would really try to connect those dots. You'd be like, yeah, sure, I could see that. A lot of TVs, you, you watch a lot, you maybe snack while you're watching TV. Sure, I could see that. However, did the TV really cause obesity, right? It didn't. I could, if, if I was a TV, if I, a TV hoarder and I had 45 TVs in my basement, is it more likely that I would be obese? Of course not, because the TVs don't cause obesity, right? So observation does not prove causation. So I'll have many people, there's data that will say newly diagnosed women with breast cancer have higher estrogen levels. That is a true observation, okay? But where is estrogen made besides the ovaries? Well, fat, fat makes estrogen, but a crummy kind of estrogen. And that when it's made, it also creates inflammation. So estrogen in that context is really a measure or marker of inflammation. And probably it's the inflammation that's the culprit and not the crummy kind of estrogen that's made by fat. So importantly, what you need to look at is randomized controlled trials. When you give women something, a hormone or a drug, what is the outcome of that? That is the important data to think about, um, not necessarily observation data. It may give us a, observation may give us a clue to look into something a little more thoroughly, but it does not prove causation. So what do all of these creatures have in common? Um, well, in case, in case that is a spiny mouse, in case that's what's stumping you. Um, well, in fact, all of those creatures have a menstrual cycle. These are the only creatures to have menstrual cycles. The rest of the mammalian kingdom have estrus. From an evolutionary biology point of view, it really makes no sense to have a menstrual cycle and shed that blood every month as opposed to just very simply reabsorbing it. Why isn't it just reabsorbed? So we don't really even understand the function of having a menstrual cycle, like having a period once a month. So um, we move forward with this lack of understanding, being the minority in the mammalian kingdom, having a menstrual cycle every month. So this is the classic menstrual graph. Um, estradiol, progesterone, you see how it goes up and down depending on where in the cycle you are. The goal of this project is basically to get the lining of the uterus ready for a fertilized egg so that it implants into that lining and pregnancy ensues. So if that doesn't happen, the lining sheds and that's the, mens that's the period. Um, what's missing on here, and 99% of the time missing on here is testosterone. Why is testosterone not on this graph? 80% of what the ovary makes is in fact testosterone. Estrogen is created from testosterone. Without testo testosterone, there would be no estrogen. The adrenal glands make a little bit of testosterone, but it's the ovaries that create testosterone at, at 10 to 15 times more than estrogen. So if you look and graph this out over a female's lifetime, this, this is what the curve would look like. And the, um, the uh, testosterone is, is measured in nanograms per deciliter. 
Estrogen is picograms per milliliter. So those are vastly different units. So if I, if I created sort of an apple to apple graph, this is what is here. So we have far more testosterone than we do estrogen. And as you can see, uh, given uh, the latter part of this graph here, uh, you can see that if, if you add oral estradiol or birth control pills, that sops up some of the bioavailable testosterone that's there. So you're effectively lowering what little testosterone a female may have at that point in, the, in the, her 40s. So um, what are indications for hormone pellet therapy? This is Dr. Greenblatt's study done in 1949. First, first testosterone went in women via pellets in 1939. There are half a dozen studies released at that, at that point in time. Uh, this is uh, one of the studies. And as, as a matter of fact, the first product marketed to women was released in 1899 to treat menopausal symptoms. And that product was called ovarian, and it was basically cow ovaries that were dried and desiccated and then uh, created into pill form, and that's what women took. The assumption, of course, was that cow ovaries would be estrogen. However, when you analyzed it, it, it was 80% testosterone was what was in that cow ovaries. So it treated menopausal symptoms pretty well, actually, but it was very cumbersome to create. So this, this, this study, in fact, um, if you will notice, highlighted in yellow, uh, indications at that time, and this study is 1949, um, menopo severe menopausal symptom, symptoms, endometriosis, fibroids, urinary frequency or nocturia, metastatic breast cancer. We knew in the 1940s, testosterone was, was useful for treating metastatic breast cancer, uh, and in fact, it was used in this country through the 1990s until tamoxifen came along. And again, as a pharmaceutical, it, it took over. Uh, however, testosterone is still used in Europe to treat metastatic breast cancer. Uh, additionally, as you'll see in this, these hormone pellets, realizing this is the 1940s for women who are not psychologically frigid to improve their libido. That's a big statement in the 1940s, actually. So we've had a hundred years of knowledge of the importance of testosterone for women, yet it is still so misrepresented in medicine and, and, in, and in our culture and the lay public, meaning people mistakenly think testosterone is for men and estrogen is for women. And, and that's the end of the story. When in fact, estrogen is critical for men. And in fact, if I put men on estrogen blockers, it gives them erectile dysfunction. So estrogen is important for men, testosterone is important for women, and probably the only hormone that is gender specific for women is in fact progesterone, which is made by the ovary itself. Slides not going. Oh, oh, here we go. Sorry, got it. Um, so primary ovarian insufficiency. So this essentially is women who go through early menopause. You know, probably at age forty-two or earlier, that would be considered um, um, this diagnosis. It could happen surgically if a woman has a total hysterectomy for a multitude of reasons. Um, this, this causes really significant risk for women. As you'll see here, you know, hormones have global effects. Every single cell in your body has estrogen receptors and testosterone re receptors, and this goes for men and women alike. So without estrogen and testosterone, remember it's the ovary we're talking about, there is a list of things that you can see that are impacted by that, and in particular, mortality. If, if hormones are not put back for these women, they have an earlier death rate, higher heart disease, higher, more osteoporosis, more fractures, more dementia, more Alzheimer's. So there is very clear data and recommendations that these women should be offered hormone replacement therapy at, through their 40s, at least until age 50. And then somehow, 
the guidelines change and then hormones somehow become not recommended. But, but, but there is, that's, that's the latter part of this conversation today. But for women going through primary ovarian insufficiency, they absolutely should be offered hormones. Otherwise it increases the risk significantly of all of those things you see listed in front of you. So postpartum depression. As you've just heard me mention, lack of hormones from the ovary has significant risk, especially on cognitive function and mental health. Postpartum depression, similarly, it's a deficiency of hormones. In pregnancy, the placenta is like a, a incredible hormone factory. Um, if, if I were to measure progesterone levels in an active, in a, a woman, a woman during her cycle, that level may be, you know, 20, 80, 100. In pregnancy, progesterone is about 400. Estrogen levels can vary anywhere from 50 to maybe 200. In pregnancy, it's 600 roughly, estrogen levels. Testosterone levels triple during pregnancy. So what happens? That woman delivers, that placenta slides out, and there's the factory. It goes from like, those giant numbers to basically zero in, you know, in hours or days. Um, some women tolerate that mostly. Okay. If you look at the rate of baby blues, depending on how you define it, up to 50% of women will actually have that. Um, certainly it becomes horrible enough where women have attempted and sometimes sadly completed suicide when really it's a hormone deficiency syndrome. So it's simple. You, they don't, you, could you treat them with antidepressants? Sure. Could you do cognitive behavior therapy? Sure. Put their hormones back, add estrogen, add progesterone, maybe even a little testosterone. They feel remarkably better. They're just needing some hormones and also probably some sleep, right? So they probably need a little help with that. Perimenopause. I like to call this the decade of hell for many women. Um, anything is normal in perimenopause, actually. Uh, hormone levels, sometimes they're not even worth checking because they can be all over the map. I, I get many women sent to me because they're tired, they need a nap, um, they can't sleep, they have night sweats, they're, you know, 2 a.m. bewitching hour, waking up at night. And then um, I asked them, well, how's your libido? And they're like, what libido? Yeah. So they've often either been placed on an antidepressant already, or they're trying to avoid being placed on an antidepressant. Well, what's going on in your, in your 30s and 40s? Low testosterone. Women in their low 40s have only 50% of the testosterone they would have had in their 20s. Sort of that's their prime. Uh, and actually probably only a quarter of the testosterone they had by age 50. So um, also anovulatory cycles is a lack of progesterone at that time as well. So that often plays into this. Um, the uh, you know, Im Im importance of testosterone in this context, you know, it, testosterone is a, is a sexuality hormone. Yes, there's a lot of things that affect women's libido, but clearly uh, testosterone has a big role in that. And if, if you look at data at couples who are, have regular intimacy, there's about a 40% divorce rate. So fixing and, uh, and replenishing these levels it can be critical for um, emotional well-being and physical well-being uh, in women in particular. So vulvovaginal atrophy, who wants to have sex if it's painful? This is a very treatable condition. There is not one single study showing that um, topical vaginal estrogen or any other topical preparation increases the risk of any cancer, not one single study. Even the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology have a position statement saying that women with a history of breast cancer can use vaginal estrogen. Um, so 
it needs to be corrected. It's, it's topically affected. It's not really systemically absorbed. So this, this is really important. Um, if you look at women in their 80s, like 85% of women will have incontinence. Some women, in fact, become homebound over it. This is a very treatable condition um, and probably needs to be more aggressively addressed. So what, what do these <laughs> folks have in common? Um, what, uh, yes, in case, you know, maybe it's the pilot whale, that's the giveaway there, killer whale. Well, these, these are the only folks who actually go through menopause of the animal kingdom, these three, that's it. So why do we go through menopause when other species don't go through menopause? Yeah, a lot of giant gaps in knowledge here or, or even just to contemplate why this happens, but we're, we're in a very select uh, <laughs> company right now. So heart disease, what impact does hormones do have on heart disease? Well, there's primary prevention and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is how do you prevent your first heart attack? Well, there is very good evidence that if you start hormones at the time of menopause, uh, ideally estradiol via an oral route that it significantly lowers the risk of heart disease by about 50%. Um, it also very importantly lowers mortality by about the same. So that is, you know, prevention is the most important thing. And the most, the most, um, the most potent thing we have to offer actually is, uh, estradiol treatment for that. Progesterone also has a role, as does testosterone. Um, there's a Danish study that followed a randomized control trial uh, that um, followed women given hormones at the time of menopause, and there was about a 73% risk of decreased risk of MI death and a 50% reduction in non fatal MI. Uh, additionally, there's the nurse's health study. So that's 120,000 women being followed for about 30 years now. And there's about a 40% reduction in cardiovascular disease in that group of women. So um, ideally, it started at the time of menopause. Um, that is the most effective time to do it. And, and caution lies in the synthetic progestins. Those would be the pharmaceutically made progestins trying to behave like progesterone because those roughly double women's risk of breast cancer. So the, the concept of shortest possible, I'm sorry, lowest dose, shortest possible time. Sure. If that's, if you're taking Prempro, then I would agree with that statement. But if you're not taking Prempro, then, then the longer you're on those hormones, the better risk reduction. And there's 60 years of data to support that statement. So osteoporosis, uh, is it caused by estrogen, low estrogen? Sure, but probably also low testosterone has a factor in that. Um, osteoporosis, if you're in your 80s, if I ask folks, what would you rather have, a heart attack or a hip fracture, what would it be? Depends if you want to live. If you'd like to live, you should pick the heart attack because you're more likely to survive a heart attack than you are a hip fracture in your 80s. Uh, it costs the U.S. government more. Osteoporosis costs the U.S. government more than having a heart attack, actually. It leads to chronic disability, and only a quarter of a folks regain their level of function that they had prior to their hip fracture. Estrogen is very protective for bones. In fact, um, if I compare a 70-year-old male and a 70-year-old female, the 70-year-old male actually has far more estrogen than the 70-year-old female. It's also why men have only a third of the rate of Alzheimer's and dementia compared to women, because estrogen is so protective. So um, very important to uh, not wait until people fracture before you treat them. That would, you know, bone density testing is really important. And I, I would love to see every woman getting a bone density at the time of menopause, because at menopause, um, about 50% of those women will already have a T-score less than minus one. 
that's the time when you'd want to start hormones to protect your bones and your heart, actually, not wait until you already have a fracture because then you're already behind the eight ball. That would be like waiting for someone to have a stroke before you check their blood pressure, right? So, so knowing what your bones are doing is, is an important thing uh, to be aware of and to treat before you have a fracture. So not all hormones are created equally. You've already heard me mention that of the um, differences between types of estrogens, types of progestins, and testosterone. Sadly, in this country, there's not, uh, an, there's not an FDA approved patch uh, that would be um, easy for people to get prescribed to them. Uh, in fact, it is available in uh, Australia, that patch is. And there are some topical products that are also available in Australia and the UK, but nothing is FDA approved here in the US. So therefore, everything has to be off label for women in that context. Um, it's not that there's not data because there's lots of data. And in fact, in 2004, there was an FDA, uh, I'm sorry, a testosterone patch up for FDA approval. And it was specifically for low libido for women who had a complete hysterectomy. So that's ovaries are out. There's very good data that it was effective and useful. Um, the, the FDA, I think, was a little uh, shell-shocked from the WHI study you know, having that uh, headline about breast cancer in 2002. So in 2004, the FDA basically uh, said the, a quarter of the FDA panel said the value of women's sexual health is of an unclear clinical significance. So sadly, that did not get approved despite great data. At this moment, I would guesstimate that I have probably 30 FDA approved products for men to treat their low testosterone and erectile dysfunction, but nothing clinically relevant for women, sadly. Um, hopefully there eventually will be something, but I'm, I'm not aware of anything uh, pending approval as of yet. Uh, there's drugs on the market that uh, are non-hormonal alternatives that are not very effective. And sadly, it therefore behooves our pharmaceutical industry to market this negative image of hormones to sell their drugs. It's a very simple statement. Because of the uncertainty of hormones, buy our drug, right? That's a very easy marketing pitch but it continues to propagate this misinformation about hormones and promotes their drug product. Whether, whether it's treating depression or postpartum depression, low libido, or any of, you know, vaginal dryness, use our, our drug instead of a hormone that your own body makes. Like those are, are generically available. So um, you need to sort of, have that knowledge so that you can advocate to yourself uh, and, and avoid the synthetic products and, and understand the route of administration is also important. And pellets, just to give you an idea, the, this, is, this is what a testosterone pellet looks like. It's a surgical procedure to implant that. It's done more commonly in the UK and in um, uh, Australia. And uh, as you saw, that's done in this country since 1939, the first pellets went in women at that time. So every year, more and more women are getting these pellets through various sources, despite the fact that it's not endorsed by, the, by our mainstream medical society, nor the media. And essentially it's women networking that have uh, increased the use of these pellets uh, every year, at least for the last decade. But as you've heard me say, they, it's been being done for almost you know, 80 years or so. So thank you for this opportunity tonight to share all this with you. And um, hopefully we'll get some great questions tonight. So, uh, yes, so we have a question here in Montrose. Yeah. Hey, 
So I will, yes, I'll repeat the question. So I was asked, why is it that hormones don't stay in balance and why do they go away? Like, why don't we just keep producing them, right? So, um, so in 1900, the average life expectancy was about 50, if that. So if you think about evolutionary biology, kind of once you're done with the ability to reproduce, that's often the end of the road. So through modern medicine, clean water, et cetera, we have extended that life expectancy another 30 years. So maybe what's unnatural is living beyond 50. So those factories just kind of run out of gas and go away because from an evolutionary biology point of view, this, that's kind of the end of the road. So, um, you know, for men having low testosterone, they're often a decade behind women. They don't have, you know, the heralding in of a lack of a menstrual cycle to let them know that that's the end of their testosterone, so to speak. So it, it is often very insidious for men, uh, symptoms of low testosterone, but it, it's a similar, those factories are just done. And, and this, despite the fact in medicine, if you have low thyroid, we don't even think twice about treating your low thyroid, but why we don't think about fixing your low testosterone or your low estrogen, I don't have a good answer for why we don't think of it in the same way. We're going to take the next question from the audience here in the Anschutz Medical Campus Arena. Does anybody have a question? We have one. Okay, are we out of luck if we don't start hormone therapy and we've already gone through menopause? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? So are the we out of luck if we have already gone through menopause but have not started any sort of hormone therapy or help with our hormones? The question is, are women who've already gone through menopause out of luck with respect to being able to benefit from starting from hormone therapy? So that, that's a question I, I get uh, often ans asked, and I, I appreciate that you brought that up as a concept. So um, if you were to start Prempro, which I would not recommend starting Prempro, but if you did the Premarin and the Medroxyprogesterone, they do increase your risk slightly of clotting, so a uh, blood clot in your lungs or legs. That was shown basically high risk women starting PremPro at an older age, there were roughly 30 more blood clots per 10,000 women, 30 per 10,000. So you will hear people say, well, you know, it increases your risk of clotting. Well, it does 30 per 10,000 in that high risk population. So don't start Premarin or Prempro if you're a high risk person, um, you know, more than a decade past menopause. However, estradiol taken orally does not have the same risk as Premarin and progesterone does not have the same risk as medroxyprogesterone. And, and in fact, they are, medroxyprogesterone and progesterone are so very different that if you're a pregnant woman and you're miscarrying frequently, you would treat that woman with progesterone. You give a progesterone to hold on to that pregnancy. If you gave her medroxy progesterone, it causes birth defects. That's how different they are. So no, you're not out of luck and it ain't over till it's over. And uh, there is no data that testosterone cl increases clotting in any way, shape, or form. And um, I, I think importantly, they all need to be balanced. I mean, when you think about hormones, uh, you, like I think of it as being an orchestra, like a symphony. You, you can't just treat the horn section, right? They all need to be put back and they all need to be balanced, really importantly. So um, I think... Uh, worth, worth 
probably finding a physician or provider who's a bit versed in that because what you get from mainstream medicine is you miss the boat. And, um, and that, in my opinion, is not really the case. Question from the chat, whatever it's called. Okay, so um, can you share where you found the data to support that 95% of women who get breast cancer can be cured? The question is, can you share where you found the data that 95% of women who have breast cancer can be cured? Yeah, those are American Cancer Society stats. Basically, you can look that up online um, and that would be there. Probably at the beginning of my career, there was about a 72% cure rate. So you're, now it's uh, upwards of 94 to 95% actually, really because of the modern um, medications, chemo agents we have to treat breast cancer compared to what we had 20 years ago. So mammograms help a little bit, but it's, it's the uh, drugs and oncology agents that have allowed us to get to that rate at five years. And as a follow-up to that, wouldn't it also be the increase in mammography and early detection? No, actually that's a very minor player in breast cancer survival. That affects that number I just gave out by about only 8%. Um, interestingly, if you look at mammography data over the last 20 years, you know, it's really come out of the gate hard to get your mammogram, have breast awareness, do all of those things. And so despite that, the number of stage three and stage four breast cancer showing up for initial diagnosis really hasn't changed. So if, if early detection in that way was as important as we perceive it to be, there should be far fewer stage three and stage four breast cancers, but there's actually not. So the bulk of that, a little bit is for early diagnosis, but the bulk of it is due to our better treatment options that we have available now for breast cancer. Thank you. We turn it over for a question from your group. Yeah. So the question, the question is, how do you test for hormone levels and how frequently should you monitor them? So I would ask for men or for women or both. So, um, so for, for men, um, currently there is guidelines to say that if you get a first morning blood level of testosterone and it's under 300, and you have symptoms that you therefore meet guidelines to treat low testosterone in men. Importantly, for men and women alike, testosterone is, is released first thing in the morning along with cortisol to get us ready for the day. Testosterone is actually a stress hormone. So you need to check it early, or, you know, within a couple of hours of waking up so that you have a reproducible number. Uh, as far as whether the, you know, the validity of that 300 level that the, US, that the FDA created in 2014, prior to that, we just treated men based on symptoms. Like if you had symptoms of low testosterone, then in fact, you deserved a treatment of testosterone replacement. You know, I will say the, the pharmaceutical industry direct to, to consumer advertising, it, it did get a bit over the top in terms of men, do you have low T? You know, you have a hangnail, do you have low T? So it kind of got over the top, which is why the FDA put the brakes on it. Um, but in general, the, the data predating 2014, men were just treated based on symptoms of low T, not on a number per se, because what's not measurable is your receptor sensitivities. So also what, you know, you just get a total testosterone level typically is what's checked. That in fact is the storage form of testosterone. So your cells have no access to that storage form at all. It's only the free or bioavailable that cells have access to. So in fact, the more accurate thing would be a free or bioavailable testosterone. And that's especially important because 
there are many medications out there that are common medications that lower testosterone, um, specifically uh, antidepressants or SSRIs, lower testo bioavailable testosterone by about 50%. Statins, which are cholesterol lowering medicines, lower testosterone by about 50%. Beta blockers, some seizure meds. So, so it's the bioavailable testosterone, both for men and women, that's the relevant part of the equation. So, so that would be more of interest to get that checked, especially with, with polypharmacy and multiple medications being taken. So for women, first thing in the morning, there is, you know, there's a, I'm always amused at the reference range. It will be zero. I don't know how it's normal or okay to have zero testosterone um, up to say 60 on average. However, there is very clear evidence that those levels don't correlate to symptoms. So um, again, we're back to a conversation. If you have lots of symptoms of low testosterone as a female, and, and you've heard me go through some of them already, the middle of the night wakening, low mood, amotivational, dry eye, urinary incontinence, um, migraine headaches in your 30s or 40s, those are often symptoms of low testosterone. So certainly worth a look at where those levels are. And, um, but, but for women, the data is very clear. The level, the lab doesn't correlate with the symptoms. Thank you. We'll take a question oh, from the audience. Sorry, there, was, there was just a follow-up. How frequently do you, so, um, in, on therapy or not on therapy? I mean, lots of people will get like a yearly lab just of interest to see what their levels are doing as far as declining versus not declining. Um, I think from a treatment perspective, I personally grab levels after the pellets go in, but then moving forward from there, as you've heard me already say, it's based on symptoms, not labs. Because imagine say your level looks perhaps that it's okay, but you still have symptoms of low testosterone. What would I say? Well, you should feel fine because the lab says you should, but you know, treating the patients, some people need higher dosing of hormones to get the same effect. And I, I equate it to insulin. Like when people have insulin resistance or pre-diabetes, like we don't, we don't think twice about that, that you can have uh, a hormone resistance. Well, why can't you have hormone resistance for every single hormone, right? As a concept, of course you can. We, we haven't specifically in medicine looked at it in that way, but if you can be resistant to insulin, why not every other hormone, right? So frequency is gonna depend on that individual person and the treatment they're getting, I guess, is how I would think of that. I think there's another question. We have a question from our audience next. Yeah. My question has to do with bone density. So how often should bone density tests be done? And if you're um, prone to uh, osteoporosis, what sort of medications are um, safe to take? Because there's a lot of side effects that can occur with medications for that particular um, disease. Could you ask your first question first, and I can repeat it because I kind of forgot it in listening to the second one. I think it was how, if I may, how often should bone density testing be done? That was part one. So I, as I've already mentioned, I, like I think every female at menopause, especially if you're Asian or white, because we already know that they're those groups are at risk for having osteoporosis. 80% of your bone density is genetically determined. So clearly anyone with osteoporosis in their family, if, or if they have longevity in their family, you know, if you're going to likely live into your nineties, well, you better be paying attention to your bones. So I, I think anyone with any risk at menopause, I'm sorry, should have a bone density so they can make decisions at that point in time. And then, uh, you know, Medicare covers it at age 65. I think sadly that's missing the boat though. Uh, they will cover it for every two years 
um, and most insurances, it's every two years after age 65, unless you're on a high risk medication, like you're on oral prednisone, or if you're on drugs for breast cancer treatment, like aromatase inhibitors, which block estrogen, that's a high risk medication. They'll cover it every year at that point. And your follow-up question? The, fo the follow-up, I believe, if I recall, was what are the osteoporosis medications that are out there and what are their risks versus benefits? I think that was kind of a big question. And I, I almost feel like that's a whole nother lecture um, because it's complex. You know, we have the uh, old school bisphosphonates, which are alendronate and Fosamax. Some of you may know there is denosumab, which is prolia. That's the every six month injectable, which in, in general, I am not a fan of only because that medication, if you miss a single dose, it's every six months. And if you miss a single dose, there's rebound bone loss and a increased risk of multiple vertebral compression fractures with one single missed dose. And I will tell you, life happens. I have people who miss doses, you know, their husband had a stroke, they just forgot, COVID came, people miss doses. And I think that's a pretty big price to pay uh, for missing one dose. So denosumab or prolia, I typically don't recommend and then other, you know, new kids on the block for osteoporosis are the parathyroid injectable medications. Uh, so they are either once a month uh, for a year uh, or daily uh, for two years. Those very clearly, though, have to be followed with a drug like Fosamax, which is alendronate or uh, reclass, which is zolendritic acid, because if you don't follow it with that, you lose all the bone you just gained. Um, you know, they, they often are kind of cost prohibitive. Uh, the monthly injection, I just had a patient come and tell me it was $9,000 a month that her insurance was getting billed for that injectable. So uh, it, it's a hard negotiation sometimes for them, but they are bone building anabolic agents. And then uh, as you heard Nicole mention, I, I have a study pending publication using testosterone, in fact, as an anabolic agent for women showing very significant bone improvement with uh, the testosterone pellets uh, to improve their bone density. So, uh, and then side effects of testosterone, you know, you better libido, more energy, fixes your dry eye, your incontinence, sleep better. That's the side effect of testosterone. <laughs> Thank you. We will take one more questions. One more question from the chat before we close tonight. Um, Stevenson. Should we be concerned by the hormones in the food and how may they affect us? Did you hear that? I did. So should we be concerned about the hormones in the food and how we are affected by this. So my answer is yes, you should be concerned about that. And if you look at men and their testosterone levels since the 1950s, they are declining roughly one to 2% per year since the 1950s. It's a, it's a couple of different reasons why men's testosterone levels are declining. One is because there's, you know, not as much manual labor as there used to be. So if you're, if you're doing manual labor and lots of exercise, it, it helps to keep your testosterone uh, in good shape. So there's less manual labor. There is rising obesity rates. So as you heard me mention, estrogen, estrogen's made in fat. That's for men and women alike. And then that crummy estrogen made in fat inhibits testosterone production, actually. So that lowers it for men. And then the BPAs, are at, which act as weak estrogens in food products, plastic bottles, et cetera, that also has a negative impact on testosterone as well. Because of those weak, and weak estrogens in our food source, it is likely why we have young girls who are now starting their menstrual cycles earlier and earlier and earlier, now likely because of that also. So yes, we should be concerned about that. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer how to fix that, but yes, absolutely, we should be concerned. 
Thank you, Dr. Frazetta. We would like to really thank you for your presentation tonight. Um, if any other questions come in, you can send them to the Colorado AHEC email and we'll get them over to Dr. Frazetta. I just want to mention before we put the QR code up and before we give Dr. Frazetta a big hand, next week's presentation and the final in the spring session will be Dr. Bob Belknap, who is a Minimed fan favorite over the years. He's an infectious disease specialist from Denver Health, and his presentation will be infectious disease information that isn't COVID. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Rosetta. Nicole, thank you so much to Western Colorado AHEC for hosting tonight. If we could give Dr. Rosetta a big hand wherever we are. <laughs>